All right. So one day you're going to leave your business uh, and hopefully it's on your terms. And so to understand the mind of the buyer, so to speak, and how you can set yourself up for success for a successful exit. I think there was too much success there in that sentence, but I'm super excited to bring on Jeremy Bell, uh, who's the co-founder and uh, chief M&A officer for Elevate Brands. So Jeremy, thanks for coming on Maximizing E-Commerce. Hi, Kevin. Uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, so pleasure to have you here. So uh, we were just chatting before we hit record uh, about some of the things that you know differentiates Elevate Brands. What's the purpose for you know working with an aggregator as opposed to you know working with a uh, a broker or whatever the case is. So and just also what works and what doesn't work because you guys see quite a bit from what I understand. So um, so let, let's take it back to the beginning. What is an aggregator? That seems to be a, a big word that's used in the last year. And um, some people may not have quite understand yet. So just uh, to help people you know, frame, what does that even mean? Perfect. Yeah. So aggregator is, um, it's a word that the kind of ecosystem, um, you know, has, has slapped on companies like Elevate Brands, um, Thrasio, Perch, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. all, all the rest of, I've lost count of how many aggregators there are, but effectively, um, there are groups out there who who's, uh, who have raised you know large amounts of institutional capital, and the strategy is to really kind of consolidate the the cottage industry of um, Amazon FBA sellers mm -hmm. and and build a kind of large you know e-commerce behemoth um, uh, you know th through M and A. So if you look at a, a whole bunch of kind of industries at different points in times, so whether it's you know dentists, um, you know, medical practices, um, you, know, uh, you know, like even, even the early days of Blockbuster, like mm -hmm. they were, they, you know, all those industries went through a consolidation where a bunch of smaller operators kind of got, got mopped up by operators at scale. So aggregators is the term that, um, you know, the term that people uh, are calling businesses like, like uh, Elevate. But I think that the thing that I'd say is like, we, we started on Amazon in 2016, um, doing retail arbitrage and kind of wholesale. So, yeah, I think we like to see ourselves as sort of operators first. And we we, we do get painted with the brush of being an aggregator. Um, you know, we, we were in Amazon before it was cool and we're going to be in Amazon after it was cool. So that's just the, you know, what we're passionate about. So our, our aim is to build a, you know, a large, a large you know, e-commerce business, which is on Amazon, sells around the world, but Amazon isn't also what we're famous for. We want to be on all the other e-commerce platforms as well and, um, you know, really push the D2C side of things too. Got it. So what I'm hearing is kind of an analogy might be kind of like the Marriott of um, of, of e-commerce. So like Marriott, if you go to Marriott.com and you look at all the yeah. brands that Marriott owns, they yeah. didn't start with all those brands. In fact, I used to work for a company that eventually got acquired by Marriott. And so they have a whole lot of brands that, you know, you might not even realize you're staring at, staying at a Marriott um, mm. until they ask you to sign up for their Marriott Bonvoy points. Um, but other than that, you might not realize it just because that's all kind of been lumped up. So what is, you know, whether it's Marriott, you know, acquiring hotel brands or all the big um the, the big airlines, you know, over time have kind of, you know, merged together or, you know, now we're seeing this in the Amazon space. What, what is the value proposition on the other side for, you know, money to come into the market, so to speak, and purchase and merge? Like, why is that even beneficial? For, for our investors? Yeah, for your investors, for your company, things of that nature. Just more just to kind of understand yeah, so, that part. Yeah, so I think the, the appeal for investors is... Um, Roll-ups or like the the way financial markets think about this is that they don't really call it an aggregate uh, like aggregation sure. they call it a roll-up. So okay. roll-ups are very very common um, and they oh, yeah. happen for, for for you know um, uh, you know for, for a very long time. So investors kind of are comfortable with the concept of the roll-up. I think the pitch that we give to our our investors is look like there there are there are portfolios of kind of um, assets which are either subscale or under optimized, um, and that often is, you know, down to the fact that some of these businesses are a side hustle where there's one or two people who are, you know, scaling a business and they've done a really great job and caught lightning in a bottle. And mm -hmm. so the benefit is, is you know, you, you acquire that business, 
you put it into a larger portfolio, which has systems and tech, and then you can really pull a lot of growth levers to help grow that. You know, often it's it's a very simple, you know, a simple business with maybe you know 10 SKUs or 100 SKUs. And really the, the kind of message is take that business and expand it across all other kind of e-commerce channels that are available. So, you know, they're well known, whether it's Walmart, eBay, Target, like all those other e-commerce channels where the brand isn't kind of um, positioned today. And then also take that same suite of products and expand internationally. Because, mm-hmm. you know, in some ways what we're buying is we're buying, we're buying a business where you've already got um, in, in, you've already got kind of market acceptance. Like, you know, you, you buy a business with kind of 10,000 um, reviews, which are above four and a half star and they dominate Amazon SEO ranking. Like you don't need any better proof than that, that that's a product that customers love. So, you know, big companies like Procter & Gamble or, or Unilever, um, they will spend billions of dollars a year on research and development um, to, to find something that they think will work. We, we meet sellers, you know, day in, day out that, that have either had a crazy idea or, or are very entrepreneurial and have, have, you know, tried something, launched it and made it better. And, and we're paying them a premium to buy that business. So, so our task is then to take that business and kind of, you know, grow it, um, you know, t- take effectively in some cases what, what is a product and, and turn it into a brand. Um, so so that, that's the kind of the long-term vision for us. And that is a, a value creation story that the capital markets and investors love. Um, and that's part of the reason why, um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's the biggest reason why this sector got so hot is because Wall Street woke up to this business model and they love it. So yeah, that, 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 you know, how that feeds into what I do, in, do day in, day out. My job is to really go find great Amazon or e-commerce businesses and, and figure out which ones have the highest growth potential or, or marry up with our kind of internal portfolio strategies as well. Yeah. So that's, that's a, it's interesting. And it's, I think exciting to think that, you know, big money is looking at this and saying, wow, this is a place for growth. Yeah. And cause you know, that's, you're talking about some sophisticated investors and things like that. They're not, you know, guessing here they're 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 seeing something there so that's should be a uh uh uh, something of excitement for you know e-commerce sellers Uh, e-commerce in general is a constantly growing uh percentage of retail sales um Hmm. you know we're on the front end of the curve whereas you know malls and things like that are definitely on the decline so uh, so that's super exciting now most of my experience with understanding the buy and selling world now i've not bought or sold a business before, um, has been more from, you know, uh, brokers and, you know, in full disclosure, like quiet light, for example, has yep. been a, um, a sponsor of some of the events I've hosted and I've always kind of gotten their side of things. And I've even said, you know, in some of the, uh, conversations I've publicly had with them that, you know, if a, uh, aggregator was here, I'd want to hear the aggregator story. So what is from the, opposite side now for the person selling their business, what is the advantage of working with an aggregator, for example, if they go directly to one? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, Qu- Quiet Light are an excellent, excellent brokerage firm. We bought, we bought our first business off them and it, it went oh, yeah. really, really well. Yeah, it's, it's absolute cracker. So we're, we're kind of ambivalent um, between a seller coming directly to us mm-hmm. or, or acquiring a business through a broker. Um, oh, okay. The, the biggest difference is if you go to a broker, you're going to have to pay the broker a commission for, for the right. sale. And for some sellers who, um, some sellers are, you know, some sellers are super confident and, and, you know, they're commercial and they've done their research and, you know, they've got good accounting. They're very good. You know, most entrepreneurs are pretty savvy, good negotiators and very commercial. And some of them just look at it and be like, look, I'm, I'm more than comfortable to go and, um, you know, push my way through this process. Uh, so we have sellers contact us all the time. You know, those people that we do a deal with, um, you know, will save the broker commission. Um, so that, that's why, that's how they kind of see the benefit. But if you're going to do that, like, uh, uh, you know, you need to make sure that you, your financials are kind of up to scratch. We, we work with sellers to kind of make sure that the financials are up to scratch. You know, still you need to go hire a really good lawyer because that's super important. It's the biggest financial mm. transaction of your life. And, and making sure that you've got a good lawyer advising you is key. 
Um, and there's a bunch out there that you can find. And then also just being super clear on like what your objectives are from the transaction. Um, so, you know, you know, be really clear on, on what it is that you're hoping to achieve. And then when you meet buyers, sorry, when buyers meet sellers, just be really transparent on this is what I want to achieve. Like I either want to maximize my sale proceeds. I want to make sure that the purchaser of this business has the best strategy for it. So in two years time, I can look back and the business has, you know, grown 2x um, and, and I want a share of the upside or, you know, conversely, like I want to stay involved and I, I want you guys to come and help me grow this business. So be very, very clear on what it is that you're trying to achieve. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what I say to most sellers is look like if you're thinking about appointing a broker, like it's very easy to come and speak to Elevate or, and then go speak to a couple of our competitors mm -hmm. and just, just kind of read the, um, yeah, just, just, just kind of read the, read the landscape a little bit mm -hmm. and see, see how those conversations go. Um, because, you know, um, yeah, you, you, you uh, yeah, you, you may find that you, you, you're kind of making progress and um, more progress than you think. So like, I think on, on the other side of the coin, um, you know, people who do go to brokers, um, for, for some people it is, as I said before, it is the biggest financial transaction of their life. So having someone to help you navigate through that process is key. Mm -hmm. um, the, the advice I give to um, sellers is if you do that, don't go and speak to just one broker. Like mm -hmm. tr treat that conversation the same as you would treat onboarding a new supplier. You want to have multiple phone calls. You want to, um, you know, speak to people who that not not the firm, but that broker has represented in the past. What did they do well? What didn't they do well? Where were they most useful? What were some things that happened which were, a, you know, surprise on the good side or surprise on the negative? Um, you know, ask all those questions in in the like. The, the technical term for it is you run a beauty parade where effectively uh -huh. you go and meet a whole bunch of different brokers. And um, I, I like to say that the broker, the right broker will eventually appoint themselves because you'll get the best feeling from them and, and, you know, just do all your, your, your kind of checks and reference references on them to make sure that they're as good as they say they are. Cause I've spoken to brokers in the past. I'm like, how do you go meeting, you know, winning new deals? So like, some sellers have one 30 minute phone call and then they never call, they never take a second call. Hmm. And, and I'm like that to me, that's madness because as I said before, like this is the biggest for many people, it's the, the most important financial transaction in their life. So, so, you know, spend the proper time on it. Yeah. And one little trick that someone could do and uh, my, taking a step back, my, uh, I have family on my wife's side who are yeah. retired from the FBI and I've heard through the grapevine, so to speak, if you ever do a background check through the FBI, um, they're going to ask for references hmm. and then they're going to go interview your references. Then they're going to say to those kind of like in a Columbo, Oh, by the way, Oh, by the way, um, do you know anyone else that knows so-and-so? Yeah. And then that's, they're going to go to interview that person. That's who they're really going to take stock in what the person says, because they expect that you're going to give the best, the people that are going to say the best things you're going to give them their contact information. So you could always like ask for references from, you know, the broker, the aggregator, whomever, and say, Hey, mm. um, you know, who have you worked with in the past? And then, or if they're comfortable sharing that, and then you can always ask, or just ask around to people, Hey, uh, do you know of anyone? And then ask, do you, that person, do they know of anyone? So that second person might have the uh, most interesting uh, perspective. So, yeah. um, but do your homework. Cause to your point, this is a very big transaction and I can see it being very emotionally driven. So kind of walk through what does the process look like for selling the business? Yeah. So the pro, um, I'll give it to two sides, the process from sure my perspective is the buyer and then maybe the process from if I was a seller, like how, how I would think about it. So as a, as the buyer, typically what happens is, you know, an opportunity will come into our business and that's either, you know, been referred to as it's someone that we've met. It's um, someone that's come through the website. Um, the best, the best prepared people that we meet is someone who's like spent, you know, written a, whether it's a word document or it's a PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't need to be very long. It's just, mm. here's my, here's a summary of my business. It's called a teaser. Okay. Um, and it basically just sets out, here's what my business does. Here's when I started it. Here's an overview of my strategy. 
here are the you know the growth levers which I think are available. Here are some you know some issues or key risks um, associated with the way that my business works. And then here uh, here's the kind of summary financial profile of the business, and that's revenue down to kind of um, you know contribution, or like what we call kind of seller's discretionary earnings, which mm-hmm. is a measure of profit. So how much profit did your business make, excluding any one-off or non-recurring expenses? So, you know, if you went to a conference and that was a one-off expense that you put through your business or you, you've got a car that you're running through your business that you don't use, like add that back to calculate your profit and then and then you give that to the buyer. Um, and, and the thing is, is like the reason you package it all up like that is any buyer is going to want to like any buyer, like they're some of the key kind of threshold questions that they have when they look at a new opportunity. So if you can package it up nicely for them, um, it'll make them, it naturally people will just focus on it much quicker because you've made it really easy for them to understand, okay, what is this and, and what's the opportunity? So, you know, that, that's what we see, you know, with, with most cases, that's, that's what the best, best prepared sellers do. Um, and it's, it's pretty straightforward for people to kind of just pull that together. Um, so typically what happens is someone will come in, we'll have an intro kickoff phone call with them to help screen the opportunity and make sure that it's, it's right for us. Mm-hmm. You know, I think one of the things that we're very conscious of is we don't want to waste sellers time. Um, and, and so, so we're pretty, pretty quick at a screening an opportunity and figuring out if it makes sense. So, so once we've had that initial screen, we'll follow up with like a very high level, um, you know, information request, typically around the financials and, and other different data points that we pull out of Amazon. And that's just to confirm that we understand how much money do we think this business makes? Because um, that is the basis for how we value the, the company and prepare our bid. So if you don't, um, we've met sellers who have gone with other parties where they haven't been able to provide financials. And we've just said to them, look, we think that's, we think that's actually not a good move because if a company doesn't know how much money you make, how can they stand behind the offer that they've given you? And then sure enough, four or five weeks later, they come back and they're like, yeah, they just, they just cut the price of the offer. Um, and, and we, you know, like we should have listened to you. We said, yeah, like that, that's, that, that, that was a bit of a mistake because you know, people like me, we value your business based off the earnings. And, and if we don't know what the earnings are, then there's no way you can bid the company um, okay. credibly. So, so like be very careful and, and very aware of how, how people are treating that. So we'll get the bid, we'll learn more about, sorry, we'll get the financials, we'll learn more about the business. We'll have maybe another call with the, the, the seller or the founder to, to learn more about it and make sure we're thinking about it the right way. You know, in full transparency, there's been businesses that we've looked at in the past where we've we've actually said no, like sorry, mm-hmm. we're, we're not interested, we don't want to bid, and then the sellers come back and said, hang on, like and, and written, as, written as like an essay, and then when we 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 when we reread that, we're like actually we were thinking about this all wrong, and and you know we've then pushed through and and you know submitted a bit a really a really great offer, and and now are likely to to buy that guy's business. So. Um, yeah, it's it's how you how you show up for, for that initial thing to, you know, the initial meeting with the aggregator to, to get them interested um, is key. Um, and sorry, not aggregator, but but any buyer, like how right. you how you get their attention and get them to think that you know this is a special business that these guys want to own is, is you know really part of the art of, of selling your business. So so once we have that, we prepare a you know a, a bid, we send that to the uh, to the seller. If we're all aligned, they sign they sign the LOI and or letter of intent, which is mm-hmm. which is the offer, and then we move into the underwriting process. So really, the, the whole point of underwriting is we don't know anything about the the seller's business. Um, we we can see it on Amazon, but we don't really know what's behind the you know under the hood. So really, underwriting is just trying to confirm that you know the numbers are accurate and they make sense. We fully understand the competitive dynamics of the business in more detail now that we're going to really focus on it. Um, we understand the growth strategy for the business, which is key. Like how are we actually going to grow this business when we own it? Um, and, and then the second side of it is like, are there any kind of material risks in this business that, that would force us to kind of walk away? So like, have they violated Amazon's terms of service? Have they done any black hat? Um, are they at risk of getting suspended? Like things like that, that we look for and focus on. And then a big one is can the supply chain scale you know, what's their supply like? Can we source goods cheaper? Are they reliable? 
that's probably one of the biggest risks and and one of the things that we we've gotten uh really good at because we've had to is is, is underwriting the supply chain um mm-hmm. making sure the business has enough inventory for you know the foreseeable future and then once all that's done you know that that process depending on how complicated the business is if it's a couple of SKUs and it's um, you know, and it's it's not like the earnings aren't that high, that pro all of that can get done in as quick as kind of two to three weeks. But for bigger businesses with more SKUs in different marketplaces, that process can take, you know, four weeks to kind of six weeks, depending on how 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 good the quality of the information is. Mm-hmm. After all that's done, we basically then move into legal documents. It's it's typically an asset transfer. And, you know, the the deal gets signed, we fund the money into into the lawyer's bank account and start to work on transferring all the assets over. So the Amazon login um, details, the Amazon account, uh, you know, Facebook pages, domains, all that kind of stuff. Once that's been transferred over to, to elevate the lawyers then release the the cash to the seller and, and it's kind of done. So it happens very, very quickly in, mm-hmm. in normal mergers and acquisitions, like a deal can take anywhere from kind of three to nine months Mm-hmm. So the fact that you can sell your Amazon business in, you know, anywhere from one to two months is, is super cool. Um, it's super cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So, all right. So let, let, let's, let's uh, ask, uh, unpack that a little bit. So you, you mentioned like at the beginning, you know, the best thing to do is present, you know, a good presentation or at yeah. least, you know, n- no one's going to understand your business quite like you do. So a hundred percent. Yeah. Don't, expect the person who's looking at things to, to catch everything that you want them to know about, you know, be transparent, tell them. So what are the things that might be kind of strikeouts? So don't do this or, or this is something that would move it into the uh, no pile. Yeah. Got you. So, so some of the best things that you can do to prepare your business for sale today, um, Mm -hmm. like just tangible kind of hacks and trips is Go and make sure you've got your kind of trademark registered. Mm. Um, make sure there's no risk around that trademark. If you've got a product which is unique or has unique features or you've um, done anything special to it, go and get a patent on it. Um, sellers, like for my, like when, when we see businesses where um, they've got patents that are alive and we think we can defend, mm-hmm. you get much more excited about those businesses than, mm. um, you know, just importing random random SKUs that you've sourced on Alibaba because it's actually a more defensible position. And we think those businesses um, have a longer life cycle than something that doesn't. So, so, you know, investigate um, putting patents on your product, mm-hmm. you know, go and save down, even if you don't use them, go save down your Instagram handle, your Facebook handle, uh, register your domain name, um, you know, uh, Pinterest, like all that stuff, whether, whether or not it's, it's relevant for you, um, it's probably relevant for the, for the, um, for the acquirer. So, mm-hmm. so if you've already done that stuff and, and you may or may not need it, we just look at it and we're like, sweet, that's one less you know, thing that we have to do or worry about. And, and one potential issue, one less potential issue that could stop us from wanting to buy the business. So lock in, you know, lock in all your intellectual property. Um, it's really quick. You could probably do most of it this afternoon if you really wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, Go register your trademark. Um, regis- register your trademark in other jurisdictions as well. So yeah, mm-hmm. EU, UK, China's one where we've heard some horror stories about, you know, people having conflicting trademarks and they're not allowed to export inventory out of that um, out of that region. So that that's one as well where we've met. You know, increasingly we meet sellers who who've got the full trademark kind of um, portfolio set up, which is great. Um, the, the next one, which I, which I give, which is more kind of more practical is like, if you have multiple Amazon brands, um, run them out of different seller central accounts. Mm. Now you, you, you weren't able to do that a couple of years ago, but Amazon changed their kind of policy. If you have a legitimate business reason um, and the businesses and the, the, the products kind of aren't competing with, with each other. So um, if you've got a private label brand that doesn't really apply, but what we've seen is, um, you know, if we meet a seller and they've got a seller account with three or four brands in it and they only want to sell one of them, it, it makes it very hard. Um, the business performance always, always suffers if you try and um, transplant that brand out of one seller central account mm. 
and start selling it through one of our seller central accounts. You know, migrating brand registry is, is, is painful. Um, you know, PPC costs in the new account are never as effective or efficient um, as the old account. And then even simple things like, you know, there's a, a, brand, a brand contributor score, the brand con contributor score of the new seller central account, um, which Elevate would have, isn't as high as the old seller central account. So updating listings and doing things like that, it just gets really, really messy. And, and we've kind of... Um, we've kind of made the decision that we probably won't do that um, again going forward. Uh, okay. just, just because the performance of the business suffers. So I've kind of told sellers that I've met and they're like, actually, this is how we're set up. I'm like, well, you can probably start working on, on fixing that now, but, but just know that um, we, we've done it a few times and it just doesn't really work out that well. So um, yeah, that's one thing where, you know, we, we've got 200 opportunities in our pipeline at the moment. And, and the ones that kind of find their way to the top um, are the ones that potentially have less, less integration issues. So, you know, if it was a complete scream, screamer of an opportunity, we would consider it, but it's something that sellers can fix and, you know, I'd kind of encourage them to fix it now if they can. Okay. Is there, I know you said three, four X, I believe, um, times uh, seller's discretionary earnings. Is that plus inventory or... Are there other factors involved or is that included? Do you guys include that in the multiple? Uh, yeah, it depends. Um, you know, in, in the Amazon world, people typically, you know, quote, quote a multiple and then plus inventory onto mm -hmm. it. If you have a very large business, people won't do that. You know, mm. it, it's not, it's traditionally not how kind of M&A and private equity markets valued retail businesses. Mm -hmm. It's just that the Amazon ecosystem does, but if your business makes, you know, you know, 5 million in profit, um, typically the buyer pool won't, will, will value it the way that you, you would normally value a retail business. Multiples at the moment are kind of, it just depends on the type of business and what you sell and how, mm -hmm. you know, you position on Amazon and the strength of your brand. We, we see multiples going anywhere from, you know, three times to kind of six times. Um, and, and the ones that are going for higher, you know, the characteristics of them are, They've got something really unique. They've got patents. They've kicked all the black hat competitors off Amazon. They they dominate SEO. They've got you know ten thousand or more product five star product reviews that customers love. Um, they've got new SKUs to launch. Like they're hitting a lot of they're hitting a lot of the kind of key metrics that buyers get excited about, mm -hmm. um, and that's why they're getting the premium multiples. Okay, good yeah. deal. So um, next up, I guess the. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the process. So yeah. it sounds kind of a little bit like when you get to the end, it's kind of like buying a house or selling a house yeah. where, you know, it goes to underwriting. Uh, now is the underwriting done internally by your team or is, do you have like a underwriter third party or like, you know, cause like you'd have a mortgage company doing that with a house. Yeah. So we, we like to do everything in house. Okay. Um, there are bits and pieces of it that we do, that we do give to different consultants, whether, you know, it's a PPC review or it's a black hat review. Like we do leverage, um, you know, different consultants. Um, but the, the, the main, you know, the main like body of work we do. Um, Got it. So you, you mentioned like black hat review and earlier you mentioned staying within terms of service, which I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, what are some things, some tactics that folks should avoid doing so that you would likely pass that underwriting process, not hiding it, but like, yeah, if you're doing this. Maybe you need to stop moving forward or something like that. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a kind of cautionary tale on like an early deal that we we're looking at where, um, you know, we kind of asked the seller, it's like, have you ever done anything to, you know, generate um, manipulate reviews? Like that, that's a big one. Um, that, that we focus on and like, no, I've never done anything. And as we kind of got stuck into it, um, we did a bunch of different checks and there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to kind of cross check and figure out, are they doing anything kind of nefarious? And, and we kind of caught the guy and we're like, look, you know, we basically just put to him like over the, over this period from, you know, this month to this month, we think you were doing um, search, find, buy and family and friend giveaways. And the guy mm. basically said, yeah, I was. We said, okay, well, that's, you know, we're pretty late in the game then. We were kind of five weeks into the deal. 
And it mm. was like, if you would disclose that up front, um, we could have had like a more, we could have had like a, you know, a proper conversation around it and tried to get ourselves comfort. Um, but because it was so late in the piece, like it actually made us very nervous. Cause like, if you weren't straightforward about that, what else don't we know? And, and, and it, it then creates a whole element of distrust. And the moment mm. that a buyer doesn't trust a seller, um, they're going to pull out or they're going to cut price pretty hard because, because they don't know how to price that risk. So th th that scenario there, we managed to kind of navigate through it. Um, but, but yeah, like it's, it's, you know, I, I would just say to, I would say to any buyer, um, if you think that you're going to be able to slip one, sorry, sorry. I would say to any seller, like if you think you're going to be able to slip one past a seller, it is a really, really big investment of time uh, on, on your side. So you don't want to get to the kind of the end of the process or midway through a process and have it all fall apart because they've picked up on something. So um, yeah, that, that, that's just, that's just general advice across the, across the board. Like if your supplier costs have just gone up 10%, um, you know, eventually in the underwriting process, they're going to, uh, an intelligent buyer is going to pick up on that. So it's just stuff like that you, that you should just disclose because otherwise you're just kicking the can down the road and, and a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the people looking at your business is sophisticated. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point because, you know, before when you said, you know, create kind of like a little summary, like an outline, basically a PowerPoint of your business, that's just kind of a high level. But yeah. if someone's interested, they're going through the underwriting, you know, it's kind of like when you go through a mortgage process, they start questioning you know, what is this transaction? What is this? Why did you get this deposit? Why did you make yeah. this payment? Like they're asking you all these questions. So I imagine it's probably kind of like that. So um, then let's say everything passes the underwriting and you mentioned, you know, goes into like a lawyer's account. So it's basically an escrow. Um, yeah. Is it the full amount or is there usually on the back end, there's some sort of um, earn out or whatever the term is? Yeah, so, so um, yeah, if we talk about kind of deal structures, um, at the moment, the way that most transactions that, that we've kind of seen in the market are, are structured, there's, there's a payment at close for, for the value of the business. Mm -hmm. um, inventory will get paid at close, or there could be a little bit of financing there where, you know, um, some of it is paid 90 days post-close and the rest of it kind of 180 days post-close. Mm -hmm. Like we, we've seen those types of structures. Then there's this concept of an earnout, which is basically, um, you know, to 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 kind of share risk, the the um, the buyer will will share any future upside in the business with the seller over, you know, typically a, a kind of one to two year period, um, is what we see. And and basically the the construct of it is is if the earnings of the business continue continue to grow then there's a an element of value that will then flow back to the um, flow back to the seller so you know the the way that the way that you know we kind of pitch or the way that that sort of got pitched is like you sell your business we'll continue to grow it and um, and you know in in 12 months to 2 years time you're going to get a second payment and you'll make money while you're kind of sitting on the beach so that that's the earnout structure. Um, yeah, I think what we sort of you know the way I think the the way that kind of deal deal values have evolved over the last twelve months with all this capital coming in is, um, you know, tw twelve months ago you you all you needed to do was be selling something on Amazon to make money and, and grow your business. What, what what's happened more recently is there are a bunch of macro headwinds kind of facing the ecosystem mm. um, in the short term. You know, PPC costs are high. Um, uh, container costs are through the roof. Um, you know, um, getting inventory into Amazon is, is more difficult. So people are starting to incur, you know, significant 3PL costs mm -hmm. and inventory restrictions is a problem. So there are some kind of short-term headwinds facing the, the industry. Um, so, so I think, you know, I think sellers probably, um, sellers recognize that earlier. And they also like sellers have asked themselves, like there's a bunch of acquirers here. Um, and many of them have been um, involved in Amazon less than, um, you know, the team on the other side. So 
buyers started requesting or valuing the kind of upfront multiple, the, the upfront cash at close higher, which meant that the earnout component of these businesses um, was slightly less. So I think o- over time, we sort of saw a changing in deal structures um, for, you know, buyers basically wanting more cash at close. Um, and also, I think it's kind of, you know, I think where we're at today is, I, I think the pendulum may have flipped a little bit where buyers are now looking at a seller's business and saying, hang on, like you used to make 25% margins. We can see that trending less because of some of these short, short-term impacts mm-hmm. like that EBITDA, you know, the, the, the trailing kind of 12 month profit figure that you have that potentially um, isn't going to sustain itself into, into next year. So in the back end, whether the, whether the seller sees it or not, they're discounting that figure and kind of applying a, a, you know, a multiple to that figure to come up with a deal value. So it's, it's interesting at the moment where um, profitability is kind of, you know, um, profitability is kind of under pressure um, uh, because of some of those factors that I talked about. So I think we're, yeah, I, th- I think it's going to be interesting to see how that flows through to kind of deal value and structure. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, you know, all parties have to win you know, for this to be a sustainable yeah. long-term thing. Now, one of the rubs I've heard and forget who was mentioning it to me, like it's just in a conversation that they had heard about, you know, the challenge of some of the earnout clauses that people were having. Um, and this isn't necessarily, wasn't saying yeah. elevate. It was just in general with having an earnout clause. And then the person who's taken, or not the person, or maybe it's a person or maybe it's a company, you know, that's yeah. bought the business and maybe they didn't order enough inventory or they waited too long or, you know, the, the person, you know, wasn't as skilled in PPC, you know, whatever the case is. And so now all of a sudden the profits are down and they're losing out on some of their earnout. So like, how, how does someone, cause I don't know what the right answer is. Cause there's definitely, yeah. I can see on both sides of that equation, but how does, uh, how would you suggest a seller to, keep an eye out to make sure that at least both parties, both themselves and the buyer are protected, so to speak, if that makes sense. Yeah. Good, good question. So I think, um, as, as a, uh, as the buyer is trying to understand the seller, Mm -hmm. the seller should be trying to understand the buyer. So, you know, a seller can ask as many questions back to the buyer as the buyer is asking them. So it should be a two way street. Mm. Like, you know, explain to me what your kind of acquisition performance, post-acquisition performance looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, Explain to me on your team, like who's in charge of PPC? How do you guys think about inventory forecasting and supply chain? Mm. So like ask all those questions because effectively you're you're giving the keys to um, a group and they're telling you that they're really good at operating these businesses and they've got a plan and they're going to grow it, but can can they actually do it? Because we have met, you know, we have met, yeah, like we 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 do see a lot, and and um, um, you know, there are groups who who try to be aggregators that are um, it hasn't worked out, or they're selling their portfolio, and as you click into it, you're like, okay, I I saw this deal the first time it came to market, it wasn't for us, and some of those concerns that we have actually did play out, mm. and you know, that 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 like you know, um, I, I don't know what happened to the earn out of that that seller. Um, to be honest. So, so yeah, the key is, is to ask, make sure that you as the the seller ask the right questions um, and, you know, do a little bit of reverse underwriting on the buyer to make sure that you're comfortable they can execute. Um, That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So that's key because like we've been, you know, we've been on Amazon since 2016. Um, We've been suspended three times. Um, We, you know, this was the early days when we were doing kind of retail arbitrage and all those sorts of things. It was mm. a, you know, a dirty again, but we always, we always got our accounts, you know, our accounts reinstated because um, we weren't, we weren't bad actors, but like we've lived that we've lived the kind of pain points that, you know, we've lived the pain points of being an Amazon seller. So I think we, we get it. Um, you know, typically when we buy a business, we don't, uh, the first thing we do is we kind of, you know, just go and double the inventory order in the business because if the, the aim is if you're going to try to grow a business aggressively, you want to make sure you've got enough stock on hand. Mm. So, um, you know, I think for us, like we see ourselves more as operators than we do as, 
Um, you know, we're not, we're not a bunch of guys who've just got off wall street and raised capital. Um, we've been on Amazon for a long time. So we back ourselves to grow these businesses. Um, and that's really the, you know, that, that I, I think it's key is when you go and speak to speak to seller, like if you're a buy, go and do your, your underwriting on the, on the other party. The next thing I'd say is like, if you have an earn out, um, make sure that you, make sure that you've got like access to information and whatever else is to require to figure out if things are on track. I think a lot of sellers just, they don't think about that when they do their legal contracts. It's like, okay, well, you know, my earnout's been driven on profit um, or it's been driven on revenue or whatever the, the metric of the earnout is. Do you have the, do you have access to the information to know how it's going? Um, hmm. So uh, yeah, that that's key. I think that's that's one thing that a lot of people kind of um, overlook. Um, and yeah, like I, I still have sellers, I still have sellers texting me like saying, "Hey, you realize like this skew's just stocked out? Like, what's going on?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, we saw it stocked out. Um, there's you know, you know, a thousand units in Amazon getting checked in right now." And I'll, I'll message the brand manager and be like, "Yeah, like." You know, um, it, I, I think that's great because, you know, he, he's sitting the that seller is sitting there thinking about their earn out, making sure that we're doing a good job. Mm. And he does, you know, the same token, he messages back saying like, yeah, that rebrand's going, you know, look like that. That's driven, you know, a huge improvement in your BSR, like well done, keep going. So mm. um, yeah, keep an eye on it. Don't, um, if, you, if you value your earn out, keep an eye on it. And as I said, like, I think sellers realize that, I think that the, the kind of seller community um, realize that, that there is execution risk on these earnouts, And so that's why some of them are kind of pushing for more cash at close. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, that's a, that's a great answer. So um, just to kind of wrap this up, if uh, somebody wanted to uh, get a hold of you or learn more, where would they go? Yeah. So if you, if you'd like to learn more or, or are interested in selling or thinking about how to you know, set yourself up to exit, um, you know, either come through our website, which is elevatebrands.com uh, or, or shoot me an email, jeremy at elevatebrands.com. And um, yeah, I'll either put you in touch with someone from the team or, or get on the phone myself and, and go from there. Okay, great. And so we will have uh, folks watching this on YouTube. It'll be in the description down below. And if you're listening to the audio podcast, it'll be in the show notes. So thank you so much, Jeremy. It was a good conversation. It was, uh, I, I learned quite a bit. Awesome, Kevin. Happy to be here. All right. Thanks. Catch you. Bye.